Hello, and thank you for joining us for this special half-hour edition of the News Feed. I'm Darius Miles. And I'm Amanda Rutledge. For the next 30 minutes, we will bring you stories making headlines at Virginia Tech and the New River Valley. For the first half of the newscast, we will look specifically at stories related to Virginia Tech campus and community. And later in the show, we turn our attention to the news around the New River Valley area, such as news about a program offering assistance to homeless men, and a story about how local residents take pride in their local heritage and traditions. To start off our show, we take a look at the ever-changing landscape and appearance of Virginia Tech. It will be hard not to find any type of changes happening at any given time on the campus, and it doesn't seem that it will stop anytime soon with more new additions coming later this year. While trekking around Virginia Tech's campus over the past few months, it's hard not to notice some of the major transformations either completed or in the works. For example, the addition of the new classroom building which gives the campus a fresh new space to hold classes, lectures, and labs. Some other changes the Virginia Tech community can expect to see is the completion of the replacement dorms Brody and Rash Halls in the Upper Quad. Future plans include renovating Davidson and Sandy Halls, as well as the Liberal Arts Building. With warmer weather descending upon Blacksburg, many students like to take their studying outdoors. This comes with challenges, however, when laptop batteries quickly run out of power. A new solar power charging table ensures lasting battery life and a continuation of Virginia Tech's latest effort towards a greener campus. News feed reporter Katie, L Katie Lillard has more. Virginia Tech recently unveiled a new solar panel charging table near Pritchard Hall. Designed by the president of Students for Clean Energy, the table features eight USB power stations, which are charged through two solar panels on the roof. The solar panels will store enough power to charge electronic devices for up to two cloudy days. The table is the newest addition in the movement toward a more sustainable campus. Other steps taken toward the cause include solar panels on the Perry Street parking garage, reusable and compostable containers, and water bottle refilling stations. Students hope to see even more change as the years go on. I think students take advantage of the opportunities they have that are convenient, like recycling is pretty convenient. If they have to buy things like the reusable containers, I think it's less likely that students will be using them. Another area of concern is the power plant on campus. While coal is not used to produce a majority of tech's energy, the burning of coal releases harmful pollutants, which also contribute to global warming. Um, I think a big thing is the coal plant. They still use coal to heat our water, which I think is, you know, really outdated. Actually, it's actually cheaper to use solar energy than coal for such an operation. So. Not only does coal destroy landscapes, but it's a very um, big pollutant. So I think if they move away from that, that will be a big step for sustainability on campus. Those who wish to become more involved can check out the Office of Energy and Sustainability at facilities.vt.edu slash sustainability. Reporting for the News Feed, I'm Katie Lillard. You can also learn more information from the students for clean energy at Virginia Tech. Check out their Facebook page for additional updates and information on upcoming events. Virginia Tech is ever-evolving and constantly trying to improve the safety of its students. One of those ways has been with the launch of the Heads Up Hokies campaign. Crosswalks on Virginia Tech's campus are some of the busiest in the community. The Office of Alternative Transportation implemented the Heads Up Hokies campaign in February of this year to encourage students to be more aware of their surroundings. We asked students if they thought the campaign has been effective in helping students become more alert when crossing the street. I think it can be effective, but a lot of the times I see it, but I still feel like I'm looking down at my phone. It might be. For me personally, I'm usually looking up, so when I saw it, I actually looked down to look at it while I was crossing the road, and then I read it, and I was like, wait, I should be looking up. So. I think if I was looking down, it would, but uh, yeah, it saves some lives, I hope, you know. With so many students looking down at their phones in and around crosswalks, the Heads Up Hokies campaign is appreciated now more than ever. To keep up to date on all types of campaign efforts at Virginia Tech, visit vpas.vt.edu. As a university, Virginia Tech offers many opportunities and services to students and staff. One of the services is the Virginia Tech Rescue Squad, which offers its emergency and medical services to the Virginia Tech community. Newsfeed reporter Brittany Coit gives us an inside look at how the squad works together. Virginia Tech Rescue Squad was created in 1969 and is the oldest collegiate rescue squad in Virginia. VT Rescue has been committed to providing exceptional medical care and other services for the university community. The squad consists of 40 student members who are certified as emergency medical technicians. 
BT Rescue looks for students that are willing to prioritize the rescue squad as well as embody their message and mission for the person. Um, so the overall mission for VT Rescue is to provide the best um, patient care we possibly can um, for any of our patients. Um, and then really upholding Utprosum um, to the best of our ability, um, especially since we're all students here at uh, Virginia Tech. These squad members take a lot of time out of their busy schedules as full-time students to serve the university as well as the Blacksburg community by being able to balance schoolwork and basically a full-time job. Um, it's mainly just about efficiency, you know, um, like you just don't really waste time anymore. Um, I joined Rescue as a freshman and so I picked that up like really quickly coming into um, college, like having those time commitments and so. BT Rescue squad members usually report for certain shifts, which are usually 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 a.m. every day. At the beginning of their shifts, the team conducts certain drills in order to stay up to date and refresh their memories on the skills they may need to use. VT Rescue will continue to make huge strides in continuing to stay as one of the top rescue squads in the nation and continue to be a huge part of the VT community as well as the Blacksburg community. Reporting for the Newsfeed, I'm Brittany Coit. If you would like to learn more about the Virginia Tech Rescue Squad, additional information and resources can be found at their website, www.rescue.vt.edu. For most Virginia Tech employees and students, as the 2016 school year draws to a close, so is the hectic schedules and constant bustle. But for those who work with new student and family programs, the dawn of summer signals the busiest time of the year as they prepare for one of the largest orientation summers to date. News reporter Chloe Splain has more in this report. All year long, the NSFP office is working hard, spending months in advance preparing for the next summer's orientation. Though orientation programs only take a few months during the summer, the planning of logistics never ends. The NSFP office covers every new student program from Hokie Camp to first year orientation to transfer orientation. Each program alone takes countless hours of planning, coordinating everything from signups for incoming students, planning room assignments and schedules, all the way to distributing shirts to employees and staff. Assistant Director of NSFP, Dakota Farquhar Cadell, spends every day planning out the details of an orientation summer. Logistically, we have lots of rooms to book, lots of advisors to schedule with, because about every person at the university has a time to be at orientation. They all have um, sessions to run, they all have students to host, they all have groups to manage. And with such a wide diversity of students and programs to schedule for, it takes a whole team to iron out the details. NSFP Administrative Assistant Debbie Falls works alongside the entire staff from start to finish. Um, everybody does their programs a little bit different, so therefore even though you're planning for a whole group, you're planning almost eight individual areas. As summer draws near, NSFP is ready to hit the ground running for their largest orientation yet. Reporting for the Newsfeed, I'm Chloe Spilling. To learn more about NSFP or to find out how to register a new student for orientation programs, visit nsfp.vd.edu. There's more ahead in the special edition of the Newsfeed as we continue to bring you some of the Virginia Tech's most interesting stories. Coming up, we'll show, how, we'll show you how a team of Virginia Tech students are designing a new way to measure improvements in muscle movement for children with cerebral palsy. And up next, a feature story about a Virginia Tech athlete who goes above and beyond when it comes to living out the university's ma oop prosum, that I may serve. Those stories and more are just ahead. Stay with us. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. Welcome back to this special edition of the Newsfeed. Virginia Tech senior engineering students take a year-long course called a capstone, where they work in teams and with experts in their field to conduct an open-ended project that applies all of the knowledge and skills they have developed throughout their undergraduate experience. These projects involve applying engineering principles, creating models, and designing an actual product. One team of mechanical engineering students has teamed up to help a developmental psychologist at the Virginia Tech Carolyn Research Institute 
to design a new way to measure improvements in muscle movement for children with cerebral palsy. News 3 reporter Emily Kerrigan tells us more about it in this report. The team has spent hundreds of hours working in a lab in Randolph Hall this year to develop a system for gathering more quantifiable data. The, the challenge is we would like to quantify how well they're getting better. Um, their current techniques include uh, basically scoring them from one to five on a variety of metrics, and it's uh, definitely a, a reliable way of getting data, but it's not as precise as we would like. The team has developed a two-part system to achieve this. So half of the system is worn on the child, and it's a basically a spandex shirt like you'd wear um, with sensors uh, in different parts of the shirt. So on the elbow, for example, um, they'll have a sensor that goes over the outside of the elbow. So if your arm is straight, um, the sort of distance between these two points on your arm is pretty short, and then as you bend your elbow, the distance increases. And so the way it works is it has a little box with some electronics, and it talks via Bluetooth, um, like your phone, um, to a computer, and then the computer uh, can process the data further. The team has also taken advantage of technology that already exists to create the next piece. So the Connect is a motion, motion tracking device developed by Microsoft and it has the ability to track joint angles and so we're using that to kind of be a backup and help uh, calibrate our device. We are confident that the Kinect is going to be accurate. We can have the patient step in front of the Kinect and we can recalibrate our device based on the Kinect readings. For the Newsfeed, I'm Emily Kerrigan. These tools will be used on patients who are between the ages of 3 and 12 years old. Bollinger says making something that will be used by real patients and doctors add both extra pressure and motivation to get it done right. Community service is one thing that is constantly being reflected through Virginia Tech's model UTPROSM. From the Corps of Cadets to school-wide initiatives that promote serving the community, it is no secret that Virginia Tech students love to give back. Some individuals in the athletic department have truly embraced the school's motto and applied it in their own way. News to your reporter Delia Moresco joins us to tell us more. Delia? Thanks, Amanda. The athletic department at Virginia Tech strongly encourages their athletic teams to participate in different community service events throughout the year. The department does not require individual efforts, but some individuals like senior Matthew Doby on the baseball team take it upon themselves to make a difference with an issue they're passionate about. On the campus of Virginia Tech, Oud Prosum is more than just a saying. It's reflected throughout the campus in different ways, and it's what makes Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech. In the athletic department, each team reaches out to the community in some way. However, some student-athletes have gone above and beyond in certain areas they're passionate about. One athlete who has been recognized as going above and beyond in community service efforts is Matthew Doby, a senior on the baseball team. Um, he's really passionate about being involved in a lot of different things. Um, I know he's really involved with Special Olympics on his own, but then he's, that's not the only thing he does. Although the baseball team is one of the most active teams in the community with their 19 Ways campaign, Matt's own personal experiences have motivated him in different ways. Just watch my brother every day. Uh, he struggles with kind of the normal things that uh, a, lot of, a lot of people, especially athletes, might take for granted. Um, so watching him struggle with the everyday things kind of, kind of humbles you. Matt points to his own experiences with children with special needs as the main driving reason for his continued involvement with Special Olympics. I see when people help him, um, how much better, like mentally healthy he is. Um, so I know when, when people you look up to or people you really care about come to help you and show they really care about you, it's really motivating for for other people, whether they're special needs or just little kids. or Although the athletic department encourages athletes to get out and serve their community, Matt is an individual that has stood out as having gone above and beyond during his college career and has truly lived out the Utpros and motto. There's something to be said about a university motto being put to work throughout the entire campus, including the athletic department. Reporting for the news feed, I'm Julie Moresco. Back to you at the news desk. Thanks, Delia. Here's a question for you. With new books being published every day, how do libraries create space for them on their shelves? For most libraries, the process of weeding books is the primary solution for a lack of space on bookshelves. Library weeding, or a librarian's process for removing materials from circulation, is prevalent across all forms of libraries. According to Blacksburg Public Library's head supervisor, Elizabeth Sensabaugh, books at public libraries are evaluated by checkout rate and popular demand before being weeded from the collection. 
For public libraries, maintaining the newest and most popular materials is the top priority. But not all libraries' worth comes from their contemporary selections. According to the head of technical services and collections for Virginia Tech libraries, Leslie O'Brien, research libraries, such as Virginia Tech's, are valued by the historical range of their collection. So just as an example for Virginia Tech, it would be agriculture would be a main focus of the collection and people might be studying the history of agriculture and indeed they're looking at you know, how did people farm in the 30s? How did people farm before pesticides? So we're very interested in looking at those kinds of historical um, data. So before weeding any physical items, libraries refer to interlibrary agreements to ensure weeded materials will be available elsewhere. Well, that wraps up our look at some of the stories making news in the Virginia Tech community. Stick around, there's more ahead. Coming up, a look at some stories around the New River Valley. Our news feed partners, Peyton Knobloch and Emily Kerrigan, are standing by in the newsroom and they will take you through the second half of this newscast. Peyton and Emily? Thanks, Amanda and Darius. That's right, we will be switching gears, turning our focus to the New River Valley. Yes, and some of the stories just ahead are an update on plans to reopen a portion of University City Boulevard, which has been an inconvenience for a while for some commuters, and we'll be bringing you a story about a program offering assistance to homeless men. Plus, a team of high school students are doing extraordinary things in the field of robotics. We'll show you how their work matched up against other students around the country. So, stay with us. We'll be right back after this short break. couldn't dream that I would never become a superhero but I learned how to fly just to come back in a new disguise and be the hero that I've always wanted to be Hello and welcome back to the second half of this special half hour edition of the News Feed. I'm Peyton Knobloch. And I'm Emily Kerrigan. In the first half of our newscast, we looked at some of the top stories about Virginia Tech. And now we turn our attention to news around the New River Valley area. According to a nonprofit called Future and Humanity that deals with poverty and mental illness, on any given day, 61% of the adult population using homeless assistance programs is men. Until 2008, there were no programs offering assistance to homeless men in the New River Valley. However, when a well-known homeless man in, Blacks in the Blacksburg community passed away, a group of concerned citizens came together to address this need in the New River Valley. Their concerns resulted in an organization called To Our House, which provides overnight winter shelter exclusively for homeless men in the New River Valley. It is part of the New River Community Action Organization, which hosts the intake office that connects homeless men to transportation to a warm overnight shelter. There, they are provided a warm dinner, a place to sleep and socialize, breakfast in the morning, and a bag lunch to get them through until the next night. When they're not confronted with these daily survival needs, then they can start looking past that next 24 to 48 hours. If they know where their meal is coming from, if they know that they have a place to sleep, if they know all these things are, are part of the program, then they can start seeing beyond, all right, what do I need to do next? Where can I go to get off the street? To Our House also provides men with advocacy services and strives to find stable homes and jobs for each of their guests. One thrift store in the New River Valley is helping build homes. Habitat for Humanity is an international organization, and the Habitat for Humanity Restore, located in Christiansburg, helps to build homes in the NRV community. Newsfeed reporter Kate Cashwell tells us more in this report. The Habitat for Humanity Restore of the New River Valley is located in Christiansburg, Virginia on North Franklin Street. 
Open from 10 to 6, Tuesday through Saturday, the ReStore is not your normal thrift store. The ReStore features recycled tile right when you walk in the doors and special paint that contains 10% recycled material. Besides paint and tile, the ReStore features a handcrafted section made by volunteers. Windows, gardening supplies, books, and hardware are also for sale in the store. Lighting fixtures and high-quality appliances are something you won't find in your average thrift store. The ReStore is a popular place for college students to shop for their apartments and dorms. Kim Snyder and Matt Sandoval agree that there are many ways to get involved buying or donating used items to the ReStore. Builds, we, we have a, a lifespan friendly um, re home repair program and uh, that's something that requires a little bit of skilled labor but uh, it's, a, it's a, a program that's very much needed in the community and it's for people who are aging in place in their homes and students can come in and help. Um, are looking for a place where they can get some materials without having to go to a commercial place like Lowe's or Home Depot or um, any home appliance stores, you know, you want to have a good family environment and people that, you know, are really willing to help and get you what you need. I think the Habitat for Humanity, it's a real good store. Donations and purchases directly benefit the New River Valley Habitat for Humanity and help to build homes in the community. Stop in and look around the many available items for sale or consider donating to a great cause. Reporting for the newsfeed, this is Kate Cashwell. For more information about donations and store hours, as well as ways to get involved, you can visit habitatnrv.org. Local businesses in the New River Valley are a huge part in the surrounding communities. Being local derives from individual, environmentally friendly practices and natural, sustainable efforts. Residents of the town of Blacksburg, Virginia Tech students, and majority of those within the NRV area take pride in their local heritage and traditions. Newsfeed reporter Rhiannon Miller has more for us from the newsroom. Rhiannon? Thanks, Peyton. Buy local, eat local, be local is a saying, message, and lifestyle New River Valley residents convey and follow. New River Valley communities promote and support local goods and services. Local business and venture opportunities are important in the eyes of the individuals. One ideal of being and living local is to provide knowledge on public health and to increase awareness and education on the value of locally produced and sustainably grown food. Local opportunities assist those with limited resources in providing access to affordable healthy food. Farmers markets, small businesses and seasonal goods foster a vibrant local economy and spread an environment of community gathering. Locally grown, environmentally friendly, sustainable goods are effectively marketed in the New River Valley to enhance strategies for internal market management and communication. Those interested in becoming involved within the local movement should research possible options, volunteering, donating to the cause, joining a local group, or applying to be a vendor are all worthwhile options. Additional information and resources on local goods and services can be found at the New River Valley's website, newrivervalley.net. I'm Rhiannon Miller, reporting from the newsroom. Back to you in the studio. There's more ahead on this special edition of the Newsfeed. Coming up, a look at the preparations that are being made for the largest amateur golf tournament in the state of Virginia, and it ought to take place here in the New River Valley. Plus, an update about a team of Montgomery County High School students who just returned from a national robotics competition. We'll tell you how they did. Stay with us, we'll return after this short break. Welcome back to this special edition of the Newsfeed. If you've driven through Northwest Blacksburg within the past year, you've probably experienced the detours, traffic, and residential headaches that have all resulted from major construction on University City Boulevard. In June of 2015, the town of Blacksburg announced one of their largest road reconstruction projects to date, a 15 to 18 month project causing UCB to be closed to through traffic. Brose and Lynn Drive, or many have used Brose and Lynn Drive as a quicker cut-through route,
causing frustration and anxiety for Bros residents. But the project is closing in on its final months, with developments including rebuilding the failing roadway, improving road safety and guardrails, and moving bike lanes. Completion is expected for the summer of 2016. You can visit blacksburg.gov UCB to learn more. Southwest Virginia is not known as the richest area for this, in the state for golf. However, that may change this summer. After over a century of waiting, the biggest amateur tournament in the state of Virginia will take place in the New River Valley this summer. Newsfeed reporter Sam Jones has more. It's been as close as Roanoke, but has never made it down to Southwest Virginia. In the 103rd year of the tournament, the Virginia State Amateur will finally be held in the New River Valley at the local Pete Dye River course of Virginia Tech. The river course is home to a variety of local college and high school golf teams. Local seems to be a theme at this year's tournament, as last year's champion, McLean Hughey, is a senior at Virginia Tech and will be defending his title at a familiar course. Also in the field is Blacksburg native and senior at Virginia Tech, Ryan Mundy. Mundy says the opportunity to play so close to home is thrilling. The tournament doesn't come to this part of the state too often, so when it does, uh, it's just really cool to play. And um, Some friends and family are able to come out, uh, come out and support you, and just playing at a course you know, staying at your own place, it's really nice. Also excited to have the tournament in Southwest Virginia this year is River Course PGA professional John Norton. Norton says having the tournament brings a new level of excitement to the area that hasn't been around for a few years. It's a big thing. It's bringing all of the players from Richmond on the, and on the east coast to, to Southwest Virginia. And it's a great event. It brings a lot of uh, no, notoriety to it. Um, and it's nice to have the defending champion playing here at Virginia Tech. The tournament will consist of two days of stroke play that will act as a qualifying for the following days of match play. The match play final will consist of a 36 hole match between the two final players that make it through a single elimination bracket. Reporting for the news feed, I'm Sam Jones. The 103rd Virginia State Amateur Championship is open for qualifying to all Virginia citizens who currently hold amateur status. For more information, please visit vsga.org slash amateur. Some New River Valley high schoolers just returned from a national robotics competition in the heartland. They call themselves Team 401. On April 27th, they loaded up to leave Christiansburg High School for the first robotics competition in St. Louis, Missouri. The team consisted of students from several high schools around the New River Valley to attend a special weekly robotics class at Christiansburg High School. The competition, which brings together schools from around the country and, get, and beyond, gives teams six weeks to construct a program, construct and program a robot to, complete in a, to compete in sports-like events. Team 401 had a great go at it in the competition, but hit some minor road bumps. Uh, in St. Louis, we um, started out pretty rough and then uh, made continual improvements to the machine. So although we came out uh, in the end ranked I think it was 40, 47th out of 100, out of 75. Um, it was a pretty stiff competition. Despite the struggles at the tournament, Culver said that he is proud of the students and their accomplishments. And that will wrap up this special edition of the Newsfeed. The Newsfeed will be taking a break over the summer, but we will be returning in September with a brand new group of reporters and anchors and a new crop of stories to keep you up to date about what's going on with Virginia Tech and the New River Valley area. While we're on hiatus, if you have a story idea, connect with us on Facebook or Twitter, or send us an email at thenewsfeednrv at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us. I'm Emily Kerrigan. And I'm Peyton Knobloch. Enjoy the rest of your spring and have a wonderful summer.